Hello. Our story begins in exile from the Jedi Order, in the home that was his on Coruscant. Jedi Master Skywalker left the only place he knew and a choice of solidarity with the Force. He understood how difficult the life he chose for himself could become. It'd be one away from anyone he ever knew. He'd have no allies, he'd have no community, he would have to make a life for his own, and without the only thing he ever knew, it would be a difficult task. Master Skywalker was a talented Jedi and a wise young man. He had a prospect to be on the High Council, and it was highly suspected that he would be on the Council even before Yoda's last student, Master Dooku. Skywalker was very well spoken and his closest allies and friends seemed to have an effect on him like no other. It's what convinced him to completely abandon the Jedi Order. A conversation with Dooku about a mission he had to Raxus Segundus pushed Skywalker away from the Order after Master Kateri's death. He left without telling a soul. He took his credits, a Jedi starship, and vanished into the galaxy. Truthfully, he was so put off by the entire thing that he decided he would just outright leave the Jedi Order. He believed the decision suited him well, but there was no way of telling this early into the endeavor. As Master Skywalker fled the Deep Core, he decided on a planet furthest from Coruscant. It wasn't really, but it was quiet to know his backwater. There'd be no sign of the Republic here. Instead, he'd find sand, two suns, and trouble in any which direction. Skywalker sold his Jedi ship so he could buy permanent residence, and with that residence, some open space. Master Skywalker was very talented as a mechanic, and he knew that if he'd get his hand in the auto body business, he'd be set for life, so that's what he did. He made sure he was set for life by taking up a passion mechanic work on pod racers. He'd work on fighters and space vessels, but the main priority were the racers on the planet. As an insightful man, he knew where business was on the planet, and if he could become the main mechanic for a pod racer, he could elicit himself a way to stay free from the Syndicate powers. There's a whole new society to learn down here, but he was a quick learner. Lanaz Skywalker started buying older vessels and refurbishing them, before selling them off to make more credits. He did this throughout the entirety of 46 BBY. Of course, there were struggles for the 32-year-old man. He was one of the younger Jedi in the order to reach the rank of master at his age. Him leaving didn't change his outlook on anything. Sure, he was without an order and without his friends, but he quickly gained a community, hiding the fact that he was a Jedi, removing anything but a couple of tunics, all of which were fine pressed in line with fabric from the core, and of course, he kept his Jedi weapon too. Very quickly, after becoming a solid business in the area, he did have his first interaction with the huts, and he did not care for them. But he had to pay up, as was the law of the land. Of course, he could do something about it, but that wasn't in his power yet. He needed to play by the rules and understand how things worked, and then he could do what had to be done. Over the next three years, Lanaz continued his business and expanded to a new location where he was able to hire employees and hold up to four pod racers and three space vessels at a time. Or maybe just seven pod racers and maybe just seven space vessels. Anyways, regardless, he had enough room for anything he needed. He did live at this location, but that was fine for him. It was a safer location in town, away from gang-related territory or activity. If he was anywhere near those locations, he'd have parts stolen from him and so forth. At this point, Lanaz was doing well enough where he could have security droids patrolling the shop, though the Jedi in him continued to strike at him. He helped people where he could. If he had extra money, he would buy slaves and then free them by hiring them for his company. He didn't force them to stay, but he did it because it would give them a chance to get on their feet if they wanted to be hired by him. As he was doing this, he noticed a Twidarian who was often at times trying to compete with him but failing. Wada was very hostile. He craved money, but Skywalker was doing his work out of the goodness of his heart. Over the years, despite him growing a business and working on vehicles, he found a sense of peace and heart, especially with the Force. While he wasn't a vigilante, going out and hunting people down, breaking kneecaps and whatnot, he was a shining example of hope in the city of Mosespa. The planet was full of scum, and he was not one of those scum. He uplifted people who were down. He stopped pirates when they hunted their prey. He gave people a person to confide in. Skywalker was what everyone loved or hated. There was no in between. He was a tough pill to swallow, but he always had been like that, even as a Jedi. It didn't stop him from helping others. During this period of time, a woman by the name of Shmi Elikor was brought to Watto in the slave trade. Lanaz was always against the idea of slavery and bought everyone he could to set them free. But truthfully, this wouldn't be an easy task for him, especially with Watto. Most of the area in Mos Espa was free of slaves. Of course, especially in gang territories, there were a lot more slaves, simply because gang territory was protected by the huts. The entire system was built so the little people would target each other, the gangs versus each other. The best of them would be elevated to work under Jabba, and then essentially continue the same little ruse of fighting against each other, not getting anywhere except for working for the huts. It was a never-ending cycle on Tatooine, and no one really escaped it. Regardless, Lanaz didn't pay much attention to Shmi, but over the years they caught each other's attention, and Lanaz did everything he could to free her. 
Once he bought her freedom, he told her that she was free, she could go live on her own, because despite his adoration for her, he couldn't keep her chained up. She was a good person, and it wasn't his choice to tell her what she would do after being freed from slavery. If she wanted to continue the bond they had built up until that point, then they would. If not, then they wouldn't. Lenaz believed that she had been potentially using him to get her freedom, but that wasn't the case. Shmi was very appreciative for her freedom, and she admitted that she would like to have her own space before they decided on moving forward anywhere else. But that changed relatively quickly. She was able to use one of Lenaz's contacts to get a job doing what she wanted, and then after about seven months, she ended the lease and joined up with Lenaz. For the next two and a half years, they would live with each other alone, until in 41 BBY, Anakin was born. Shmi knew that Lenaz was a former Jedi and it never bothered her, but there was something relatively surprising to her, which was the fact that he didn't want to mention anything about the Force to their son. He didn't want Anakin growing up like he had to. For the most part, Lenaz chalked it up to trauma he experienced as a young Jedi. He didn't expect them to come out to Tatooine for his son anyways, it was against their nature. As Jedi, they were meant to protect the Republic, nothing else. It wasn't that Lenaz would cut him off from the Force entirely, he would show the boy how to skywalk, as he would call it. It wasn't the Force, it was a unique power that mom and dad had, and they taught him how to use it, even though Shmi didn't have the Force. But he could not share with others. Both Shmi and Lenaz raised Anakin with the values of a true Jedi, but with love and care. Anakin loved growing up in and around the shop. His parents were superheroes to him. While Shmi wasn't a mechanic, she had her own little hustle that brought her happiness. As a magnificent cook, she and Lenaz set up a food vehicle of sorts. Typically, her food truck was parked outside the garage, but sometimes she'd take it around, especially during Boon to Eve Day. It was a great little combination, and Anakin loved it. Once he was old enough, he learned from his father how to take apart an engine of a pod racer and put it back together. And while Anaz wanted Anakin to grow up safe without concern, he took a huge interest in pod racing. It was something both parents didn't want Anakin to do. And despite him always being around the racers, it was far too dangerous for him. In reality, Lenaz knew the truth. He was broken up about it. Anakin's ability to use the Force would allow him to thrive in such an area, such as pod racing. As Anakin got older, and he learned how to skywalk here and there, Lenaz and Shmi realized they couldn't keep the information from him forever. Anakin's dad knew the truth, too. His boy was exceptionally talented with the Force. A midichlorian count higher than that of Master Yoda's was no small feat. Part of him feared the idea of the Jedi taking his boy away from him. This is why he stopped Anakin from becoming a racer, because he would win. Anakin would have his name all the way from Tatooine to Canto Bite, and if the betters on Canto Bite got in on the action, then sure as hell he'd make his name to Coruscant. He didn't think Qui-Gon would come out here and hunt down Anakin if he saw something in a cantina bar or casino, but the same couldn't be said for some of the other Jedi. But the thoughts of his former friends forced Lanaz to reconsider leaving the Order a couple times. Don't get him wrong, he loved his family, he loved his shop and his place. Was Tatooine the greatest though? No, not really. It was alright. Anyways. His entire life changed one day when someone wandered into a shop across town. Despite hating Watto with a passion, he had to speak with him pretty much daily. It nearly pushed him to insanity, but Watto had all the information. And today's information, or news, was a guy pretending to be a Jedi, waving his hand around and such. Some guy with long hair and a beard. Didn't sound familiar to Lanaz. Last time he saw Qui-Gon, he had shorter hair, and he was only just beginning to grow it out. Qui-Gon was only a couple years younger than Lanaz, so they were close just like Duke with him. As the days continued, the Jedi received no help from the locals, not even finding Lanaz's shop. And then he got caught up in a conflict that changed everything on Tatooine. Obi-Wan was brought into town to help Qui-Gon find a shop, and when Obi-Wan almost found Lanaz's shop, he was distracted by an engagement. Maul found them. He killed the woman from Naboo and the Gungan traveling with Qui-Gon before engaging with the Jedi Master. Obi-Wan came running as fast as he could, and not far behind him was a local shop owner, Lanaz Skywalker, with his blue lightsaber. He leapt up on top of a building and scouted everything out, realizing that Qui-Gon was actually on planet. He didn't know how Qui-Gon never came to his shop. In all fairness, the shop renamed to Shmi's maiden name used to be the name Skywalker's Racing Shop, and that was just called Elicor Outpost. It was a high-end garage, every big-time racer used it, and the mechanics that worked for Lanaz were usually picked up by the racers. Regardless, Lanaz watched the fight and prepared to join in, but as Obi-Wan entered the fray, the Sith Assassin got into a groove. Lanaz couldn't believe it. He grabbed the hologram recorder and made sure he picked up on everything happening. It could be useful in the future. Lanaz could see Anakin make his presence known in the crowd. Anakin couldn't believe what was happening, and he watched intently, which forced Lanaz into an awkward situation. He didn't want to just expose himself, but he really didn't have a choice now. His only care in the fight was keeping Anakin safe, and so he prepared to pull Anakin away as he watched Qui-Gon lose control of his blade and was thrown back. Obi-Wan tried to move in, but he was kicked in the head and thrown back too. 
Lenaz thought quickly, trying to find a way to help, and he ignited his lightsaber, hoping to draw attention to himself. But Maul didn't care. His lightsaber passed right through Qui-Gon's spinal cord and he dropped to the ground. The former Master Skywalker raised his sleeve over his face, covering everything below the nose. He cut a piece of his sleeve off and wrapped it around his head to keep himself hidden. Only his eyes could be seen. He leapt down and did a kickflip, launching a barrage of sand up into the air, blasting Maul in the eyes. As he used the force to throw the Sith assassin at his feet, Skywalker turned back and helped Obi-Wan up and told him to run. Kenobi couldn't. He would stay and fight. Lanaz didn't have time. He looked over to see a lightsaber flying in his direction. He pushed Obi-Wan back and ate the blade across his face, cutting him below the eye, scarring his cheek. Lanaz fell back into the wall and watched an angry Obi-Wan press forward. His vibrant attack was aggressive. It was Form 4. It was very charismatic like Qui-Gon, but all that charisma vanished as he watched the young Jedi block a couple strikes, parry a few more, and when he thought he had an opening, he lost his life. He had no focus in the moment, and it cost him everything. Skywalker pressed himself off the wall and looked at the Sith Assassin, and rolled his blade around in his hand. He told the Sith that it ended here. The Sith launched himself forward. Master Skywalker was proficient in Form 7. Despite being so close to Dooku, he was also very friendly with Master Windu. And before Mace replaced Master Katrine on the High Council, the two Jedi Masters perfected Form 7. But Pod was so useful, and it would aid Lanaz in this moment. As Maul crossed in front of him, he spun around using all of his force and strength to press the Sith back. It had been a while since Skywalker fought against anyone else, but he handled this adversity well. He thrusted his blade forward, drawing on his skill from the young Sith assassin. Lanaz shoved Maul back and kicked forward, spinning through the air like a whirlwind before slamming his blade upwards, cutting Maul's in half. In a very aggressive way, he used the force to pull Maul towards him and thrust his lightsaber forward. Skywalker's weapon went straight through his chest as the crowd looked on. Lanaz defended his weapon and used the force to conjure up a force storm around him, lifting sand into a tornado before leaping out and leaving. The tornado stayed in place until Lanaz vanished and then the sand washed out over the crowd as left on in confusion. Because Lanaz had no reason to believe there was anyone else with the Jedi, he quickly did what he could to have the bodies transported back to Coruscant. He sent the hologram back as well, with a message from him telling the Jedi that the Sith had returned, expressing that it would be wise of them to pay attention to the realism of the threat that sat before them. Days later, the handmaidens would stumble into his shop, and he would realize that they were actually with the Jedi. He offered up his supplies considering he knew some traders that dealt with Republic-issued credits, so he could get what he was paid by them in return. The night after the fight with Maul, Lanaz returned home a little late. He was very sore and he needed time to handle the loss of his friend. While he didn't know who Obi-Wan was, he could only assume that it was his Padawan. It hurt him more because he pictured his former pupil in Obi-Wan's place, had she died. Lanaz cleared up the bodies, took their lightsabers so they couldn't be sold, and sent them back to Coruscant. Anakin was waiting for Lanaz when he walked in the door. It was a little late, past Anakin's bedtime, and he asked why he hid it. Lanaz looked at the boy and then the Shmi who shook her head, insinuating that she hadn't said a word. Lanaz sat down next to his boy and told him the truth. He told him a very thing about leaving the Jedi Order, and how he continued his practice in secrecy. It wasn't a matter of hiding it from his family, but keeping them, especially Anakin, safe. He didn't understand, and so Lanaz told Anakin that skywalking was using the Force. To the Jedi, they could all use it but not like Anakin. Truthfully, no one could use it like he could. Anakin respected his dad a lot, and this didn't change any of that respect for him. He was understanding, but he was so confused. So they talked all night long, up until the early hours of the morning. Lanaz told stories about being a Jedi and using the Force. Truthfully, most of the stories he told his son about his life were true. He just never mentioned that he was a Jedi the entire time. So Anakin, the entire time, just thought his dad was a superhero or Superman. And forever he still would be. The truth never took the magic out of the stories for Anakin. Lanaz told Anakin that if he wanted to learn the Force, he would teach him how to truly wield the Force. And then when Anakin wanted, he could use it for whatever, whether it be pod racing, mechanics, or just being on adventure. But the pod racing thing had to wait until he was at least 15 years old. Anakin didn't want to wait 6 more years, but truthfully, the deal was pretty good. Their talk was healthy and communicative. There were no more secrets, it was all out on the floor. Lanaz was the most recent member of the Lost Jedi, and he made 20. Truthfully, after today's fight, Lanaz was going to trade Anakin regardless of him figuring it out or not. Anakin's intuition was so ahead of his age, and those skills could only be amplified. Being able to pick up on Lanaz during that fight was impressive. However, there was so much more his boy needed to learn about the Force, and it would start tomorrow. Anakin was already off the bed, and as Lanaz prepared to get up, he realized it would start in a couple days. He was really sore. Yeah, he'd been practicing, but not full speed. Mostly just using the Force lightly and swinging his blade as he always had. It was a weird thing with Lanaz. He was very proficient in Form 7, but he also incorporated pieces of Form 1 into his form. It made him very difficult to duel with. He was far from a generational talent like Dooku. It was more or less he found alternative means to fighting. 
the Jedi would receive their little package of dead bodies and holograms, along with the arrival of the Handmaiden, who was currently pretending to be Padme for the sake of keeping up morale. While Dooku was upset about the death of Qui-Gon, he couldn't necessarily blame the Jedi Council. They had no involvement in the matter. He did remove Kamina from the Jedi Archives, but at the moment, he was beginning to question his choices that he made. The Jedi now realized the threat of the Sith was real, and with the body of Maul recovered, they had access to his transponders, the location of his Marauder vessel, and everything else. Though the Jedi would be too slow, cities would vacate his hiding locations before ever being discovered by the Jedi. He'd managed to get Valorum ousted from office so he could replace him as the Chancellor. On Tatooine, normal life was getting back into the swing of things. Anakin had his first training with his father. Their bond was nearly inseparable. Despite how close Anakin and Shmi were, the bond that was created through the Force alone made their connection much stronger. Anakin and his father didn't need to do stupid exercises, they just needed to get through the basics. As an experienced master, Lanaz found this extremely easy to do. Not every aspect of it was, but Anakin listened really well, wanting to impress both of his parents. He did want to use a lightsaber, but his father made it clear that the time for lightsabers would come, just not now. Instead, they worked with each other on the daily. The ignition of the flame within Lanaz would inspire him to go out to the city and use his skills for good. He left the Order for a reason, to help people, to be what the Jedi were not, and despite taking care of his family and those in the area around his home, he didn't really venture out further, he didn't do what he set out to do. He started to do that now. He knew the huts were the big bad bullies on Tatooine, but the loyal goons to the huts were also concerning. So, to get himself back into shape, he went out and made sure people were safe across the city. He would do it in the middle of the night, typically waking up and then coming back in the early morning. He got two separate groupings of four hours of sleep, four in the early evening and four in the early morning. It kept them moving and motivated. Over the years, Anakin grew up and because he was growing up, he was able to learn more unique talents, more powerful abilities, and even get his own lightsaber. Anakin wanted to learn so much, his dad teaching him not just useful lessons with the Force, but incredibly powerful lessons in life at the same time helped him grow into a bright young man. The negative influence that was present across all of Tatooine still existed, but Anakin was still able to learn humility, especially when his father humbled him. He was able to be grateful for everything, and even as he got into his later teens, started helping those around him. Anakin at the age of 15 didn't really start pod racing. He built his own racer, but he didn't race it at the boon to Eve. He simply did a couple of small and local minor events where he crushed it and earned some of his own credits. That was a big thing for Lanaz and Shmi. Despite them working hard and being pretty decently well off for living on Tatooine, they wanted him to earn his own credit so he could turn it around and do what he wanted with it. This was around the same time Anakin met a girl around his age, named Zodella Vickum. She was tomboyish, and she got along really well with Anakin. He fell for her at the sight of her, but her reaction was much more elongated. Because of the stories his parents told him about their meeting, he understood the importance of not forcing oneself onto another person. In other words, consent and that respect was greatly appreciated by Zodella. Though, she never learned about his ability to use a force, mostly because by this point in his life, it wasn't the most important thing in the world to him. The big secret for him was that he was out terrorizing mob bosses and gangs at night, and then in the morning, working in the shops like nothing happened. Anakin and Zodella had a very great bond, but the relationship aspect of it was very fragile. Their chemistry didn't exist past friendship, and neither one of them could force it to work. They had their common stories, and they had their inside jokes, but it was two people that were meant to simply exist, only to be remembered as strangers with similar stories. It fizzled out after about a year, and they went their separate ways. Anakin continued racing in the minor league and working with his father, as he continued to learn more about the Force. Because Lanaz was Master Skywalker at one point, he was able to teach Anakin things from the restricted section of the Jedi Archives, one of his personal favorites being Force Heal, and it was so helpful, especially this far out in the galaxy. He didn't know he would need it before he left, but he did. Most people on Tatooine couldn't afford medical care, and if they did, it wasn't always sanitary. The Force Heal was simple and it was effortless. That was something that was much easier for Master Skywalker. His midichlorian count was extremely high. Born on Chandrilia, he was brought to the temple within the first few months of his life. His midichlorian count was about 17,500, which was incredibly high. It was another reason why he was likely to be brought into the High Council. Because of such access to information, Anakin was incredibly skilled when he reached the age of 17, but by that point they were way deeper in than they would have liked to have been. Anakin and his father had been cracking down on spice running operations that had been taking over their area. It was a nicer way of saying that Death Stick dealers had been turning regular people into zombies. So as a way to get back at them, Anakin and his father snuck into the mob boss's hideout and they blew it up. By accident. They didn't mean to. Well, not really. It just kind of happened. This was an issue. The gangs on Tatooine all worked for Jabba, so in essence, blowing up one of the headquarters was like telling the Huts that their opinion didn't matter, and whoever did that was too cool for school. Jabba was livid. 
he hired bounty hunters to kill the gang. First of all, for failing, and then to find out who did it and kill them too. For, you know, blowing up the base. Anakin and Lanaz were really good at their undercover stuff, so they were able to get away free. But Lanaz was a little ahead of himself here. Taking on the entire Hut cartel wasn't something he had on mind, but they could make it work. Truthfully, he didn't want his son to be involved, but he couldn't really tell him no at this point. Well, he could, but like, Anakin was kind of a rebel, as most teens do, so what was there really do? Well, take back their city, that's what they could do. Anakin and Lanaz acted out of character for what a Jedi would be, but they were no Jedi. They were going to free the planet. It may have been the worst mistake they could have made. Despite them sneaking in the Jabba's palace and blowing it up, along with Jabba and a number of notable bounty hunters, it wouldn't stop the carnage. Instead, the cities were split up. It became a territorial war, just as the galaxy and the mid-rim and the core were beginning its great divide, one that would in two years kick off the Clone Wars. The people on Tatooine went to chaos. No matter how evil Jabba was, he was the beating heart of Tatooine. All power ran through him, and without him, the planet would fall apart. Luckily, the Hut Cartel would come in, but they came in with a vengeance. This did not mesh well. The gangs of Tatooine split up their districts, and the warriors of the Hut Cartel came in like soldiers on the march. Firefights erupted, buildings were burned, people were killed. The skirmishes were deadly. Unlike the gang wars where it was coalitions of people hired by the Huts to maintain the balance in the cities, this war was the people against the Huts. But because early on after the death of Jabba, the gangs split up their territories, they were left weakened when the Hut Cartel arrived. Each of the smaller districts were easier to target, and they were obliterated. The outlying ones went first. Moving in towards the center of the city was harder, and the cartel hit a breaking point. The guilt for the Skywalkers was immeasurable. They did this. They created an uprising. Anakin was so heartbroken, it went against everything his parents taught him as a boy. He created such instability with his actions, but the reality is, his actions brought new hope for Tatooine, one not seen since before the cartel took over. It may have been war, but this fight was more than just gangs against the cartel. It was people fighting for their freedom. The Huts had so much power, and because of their power, they created structures of instability to turn the people against each other. And they didn't. They put slaves into the hands of regular shop owners like Watto. And now, there was nothing protecting those owners. The slaves broke free, but instead of fleeing the cities or fighting against their owners, they stood up and fought. They couldn't go anywhere realistically, but they were fighting. There is hope in the air. And it may have been hard to see, but the Skywalkers were a symbol of change that started on Tatooine. Anakin and his father continued doing their work to keep the fighters at bay. Their area of the city was the safest place in the city. It had the least amount of conflict, but that's because it was traditionally the most loyal location in Mosespa. The people who existed here were usually closer to the Huts. Skywalker only got here because of the success of his business. He got a pass from Jabba because half the boon to Eve was reliant on his work, and so his shop was promised work in the district. Now the streets were littered with blaster holes and dead bodies. That didn't compare to the scorching and destruction in the rest of the city. The Skywalkers needed a way to push forward. The Hut Cartel had established a foothold in two separate locations, at the top of the city near the landing docks and one in the lower city. The landing docks were the easiest to hit simply because there was no risk of civilian casualties. The Nas had been conspiring with the rebels and helping them though his identity was unknown, simply to keep Shmi and Anakin safe. The rebels were able to bomb the landing platform, killing another member of the Hut crime family in the process. As the war reached back down into the city, a siege continued for months. The Huts had a lot of investments on Tatooine, and after those months went by, they realized it was no longer worth their time or money. Anakin by this point was 18 years old, and he had just helped Tatooine secure its freedom. The challenge now was how the gangs would divide up their districts, or how they would handle their governing. Having only been groups of people pinned against each other, it would only elicit more chaos. Though, in the chaos, strength is found. Anakin didn't get involved with the politics, but a product of the war and the struggle on Tatooine helped him find something he was always looking for. The rebuilding process was a difficult one to say the least, especially with warring factions across the planet. The Huts hoped that they could leave Tatooine on his own, and the planet would just suffocate under the weight of the pressure. But some of the groupings or districts gathered up so they could manage a coalition. This only happened in Mos Espa mostly because the crowd of Mos Eisley were all borderline sociopaths. Anakin and his father helped with the reconstruction process, but being as Anakin was old enough to go out-out, he did. The dystopian world wasn't a pretty sight. Hell, Tatooine wasn't to begin with, but it couldn't get much worse. Anakin found himself in the lively part of town. It was called Broadway, simply because of the wide streets and how broad they were. There was live music in this area, and it was where Anakin laid his eyes on Cure Teal Danelia. She was with a group of singers. Well, they were certainly something. They had the stage all to themselves in a broken up building. Their eyes met, but she was the star of the show. She owned it. Her presence was such an allure, such a natural talent, so elegant, and her voice cut through the air so pleasantly. How could he not be awestruck upon seeing her? Their group was wrapping up, and she hopped off stage. 
Anakin found a sleep and kept an eye out for her, but he didn't see any sight of her. They came back out for an encore where she sung another song she wrote, and before it ended, she sent a wink Anakin's way before disappearing into the night. It took a grip of him and it didn't let go. He couldn't stop thinking about that wink, as if it had saved his life or was the only memory he had access to. It was the type of thing that bought Kier Teal free rent inside of his mind. He went back a couple nights after but found no sight of her. One day he did find her, but it was in a much different circumstance and it was completely coincidental. She was on the outskirts of town, writing a song when he came along. It was very quiet as a meeting, very peaceful, very short. Anakin was going along the outskirts and he came across her singing. Their short conversation was the beginning of a bond. Anakin feared that this bond would be like the last one, but he trusted that whatever happened was meant to happen. He was content with the slow approach. He did get a chance to see her a couple more times when she was performing, and from there they continued to speak. Their slow burn only continued from there, and it was beautiful. Anakin feared what happened before happening again, but it never showed up. They never faced it, but a major care for Kier Teal was trust. She just needed to be able to trust him, and she didn't. He also trusted her. As their slow burn developed over the next year, war would strike at the Republic and Anakin would consider doing it and joining it. Truthfully, there was prestige out there. If he left Tatooine, he could find himself inside the Grand Army of the Republic or even the Confederacy. Anakin's father had no interest in the war. He moved from the shop onto the political realm so he could help more people, more efficiently. It did work too. He was currently the daimyo of the city, mostly because people before the war accounted him doing things for everyone and anyone out of care. The respect he incurred was so important for his rise to power, but he took it in stride and humility. Linaz didn't try and dissuade Anakin from joining the war effort. He just made it extremely clear that he had no issues with him doing it, but if he did, he might not come back the same person. Living in the core and being around Jedi could change him. By this point, Linaz lost his fear of Anakin running into the Sith, believing the Jedi were wise enough to snuff him out and kill him. They weren't, but he also knew that Anakin could find luxury far greater than what was achievable here on Tatooine. There was a serious temptation to leave. Over the years, Anakin fell out of touch with pod racing. The whole war thing took it out of him too. He lost interest in it because the Bunta Eve was no longer a race on Tatooine. They were trying to jumpstart it again, but the Huts owned the race, and no one wanted them coming back to ruin all the work they had accomplished in the previous year. Anakin and Kier Teal had a discussion of their own about it. He told her his feelings, and she listened, and then told him that he could make the decision if he wanted him. She just asked him if he truly cared about it or not. While Pod Racing had fallen away from him, he wasn't too sure if he wanted it or not. There was something so nice about being here with her and he didn't want to lose that. He also didn't want to stay on Tatooine forever. At the end, when he almost left, when he almost boarded the transport, he turned back and when he found Kier Teal, she was singing a song she just finished writing for him. She obviously didn't know he was listening, but when she heard him and realized he was there, she wasn't flustered or embarrassed. She was just happy. He didn't leave. He stayed. They had each other. That was more than enough for her. The past year, it seemed like that's all she needed. For the next three years, the Huts would show up a couple of times, but they wouldn't stay. They'd be driven back, and the Clone Wars would come to a rapid end. It would come with the death of the Supreme Chancellor and the destruction of the Jedi in one fell swoop. The Jedi killed by their own troopers and the Chancellor killed by his own allies. It was a weird circle, but the clones, like the people from Tatooine, were free. For the people of Tatooine, it technically didn't matter what happened to the Republic or the CIS, but the result was surprising. The Republic looked like it would lose the war, but they didn't. Anakin watched over Alicor Outpost while his father continued his term as Daimyo. It was a weird journey for him, from a Jedi to a leader of the Outer Rim world. No matter, Kier Teal and her little group of musicians were travelers. They always had been, but they got stranded on Tatooine during the war. They liked the crowds enough to stay, but believed it was time to move out for their next adventure. Kier wouldn't leave though, and instead, she let them go on without her. She loved them all and knew that she would see them again, but she wasn't going. Instead, she and Anakin had their own plans. As Anakin controlled the shop while his father ran the planet, he believed a life of quietness and peace would better suit him. He enjoyed the bond he shared with Kier Teal and he refused to let it go. They both refused to let each other go. The musician and the mechanic, what a duo. They were young and they had a life to live for themselves, and so, after saving up, they left the planet Tatooine. Shmi and Lana said goodbye to the two they loved so dearly. It wouldn't be a goodbye forever, just a temporary hiatus as the two young lovebirds explored the galaxy. There were a number of planets untouched by the war, and so they went there first and explored. It was a joyous time for them, and they enjoyed every moment of it, singing songs together and finding meadows and lakes and valleys, and the most beautiful places in the galaxy to stay. She knew of his abilities, and he knew of hers, and they never changed anything about their feelings towards each other. She may have not been able to use the Force like Anakin, but she always knew what was inside of his mind before he said it. The dynamic was as perfect as it could be. It had little hiccups along the road, but it never broke them away from each other. 
On one of the Outer Rim planets untouched by the war, they'd find their home and stay in it. It was a small home built out of wood by a small lake. It was perfect. With the Jedi and the Sith all but extinct, the life shared between Kir Teel and Anakin would be all they ever needed. They would visit Anakin's parents all the time. Considering Kir Teel was orphaned when she was younger, her home was with her music group. The dynamic in the Skywalkers was great for her, and it was much better than it ever was when Anakin was bringing Zeldella back home. Lanaz would also continue to be the daimyo for another couple years before retiring with Shmi. Tatooine would see no more invasions from the Huts, due to them being wiped out by the Republic years later. At around the time the Hut Cartel would be wiped from existence, Tatooine would become part of the Republic. For Kir Teel and Anakin, there would still be challenges, but they overcame them, just as they had during the war on Tatooine. No matter where they were physically, they were always home, because despite the balance in the Force, home was always where the other one was. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Granity Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wewoo 670, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Oz of Oz, Darth Nox, the Eternal Padawan, Malik, Johnny Nguyen, Sansa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yee Gamer, Lord Calic, Only Sire 66, Mad Man Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forders Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing, Force Pointed Channel. Smash that like button if you want to support in other ways. Go check out the Patreon. Patreon has updates for the Sith Clone Wars every week. Get early access there. Also, animations are coming in the soon future. Anyways, let's start the story. Uh, this, this was really fun to get away from, from, from the core, from the Jedi. And that's kind of what I wanted to go with. I wanted to have this dynamic between Anakin and this father figure. And this dynamic helping Anakin have like his own way to be a Jedi, but not be a Jedi. He's kind of like a little vigilante for a little bit. So like, I guess you could say the tattooing Batman. I guess there's two of them, so it's like Bat Dad and Bat Kid, I don't know. But it's it's something. And and so I wanted their dynamic to be really healthy, but I also wanted Anakin to be like really inspired by his father, whether it's how hardworking his dad was, or or just some of the traits that seem missing from the Anakin that we know in canon being with him in this story. And so that was kind of the main difference was seeing like how Anakin developed with a father figure, I suppose. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.